This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com. This show is brought to you by IndieWrestling.us. Check out IWC, RWA, and more. And listeners like you, support this show at Patreon.com slash Wrestling Mayhem Show. Hey guys, it is the Indie Mayhem Show, the show where we talk with and about independent professional wrestling with the people in the business from all around. And uh, we're getting back, obviously, into the interviews. I know we did a lot of crazy quarantine hangout stuff for several weeks, but we have some very exciting interviews and some very uh, point topics over the next couple of weeks here as we move forward. Uh, whether wrestling's happening or not in an independent fashion and whatever forms those may take these days. But uh, you know what is not changed? Books. We're going to talk about books today and and some stuff around that. Uh, please, of course, check out everything at WrestlingMayhemShow.com for this and other great podcasts that we have around professional wrestling. And over at IndieWrestling.us, this past episode's list, a lot of great interviews with people over the years. I think we just featured a classic interview we had with some guy named Wardlow. Uh, that's doing something on TV, maybe. Uh, and, of course, a lot of people we talk with on the show are uh, represented over there on multiple different formats, our live streams on Twitch, YouTube, all over the place. So please uh, uh, take a deep dive into independent professional wrestling, especially if you have some time, if you're staying away from people still at this point. Uh, so with that... I do have a very special guest, and and it's always this is like this is somebody that I've endeavored to have on the show multiple times over the years. I think we may have had you on once a long, 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 long time ago. But it, it's really easy to put people when you know they're not going anywhere. The last couple of months, <laughs> you, I, I, I I think I've like hid from you for su- such a long period of time that yeah. I finally get the opportunity. I, I did one show like. Honestly, when I when I was signing into this Google Hangouts, is that um, it came up in 2016 that we we had our last conversation. <laughs> that sounds about right. You know him by many names, man. You know that voice. Uh, I know him as Potter, mostly uh, referee Bobby Williams, Robert Robert Parker Williams. I always mess that yep. up. I got it. okay. All right, RPW. Um, and uh, did I miss any? I, I... <laughs> Mantis. Bobby Digital, uh, Harold Digital. Potter, Bobby <laughs> Potter, the list goes on and on. Oh man, <laughs> Potter is with us. Bobby Williams. However, I'm going to call you. I'm going to call you three different names through in the course of this. You know that. that that's fine. I actually uh, refereed a show one time as Norm Connors, but he doesn't have to know about that. <laughs> I'm sure he's not watching. I'm sure he's not watching. Hey, Norm. Um, but anyways, we also have a special guest, a surprise guest, actually, uh, to talk with us about as we get into our uh, main topic for this episode. Glenn Spector is with us. What's I, up, guys? How's everybody doing? I think a guy I've had exactly one conversation with over the last 20 years of being around wrestling. So, Oh, um, God. I, I know. Um, I really like, like, just before we even get into any of the other big, big type stuff, like um, Bobby did a lot to kind of bring me like uh, like Bobby. I struggled a lot after, uh, you know, all the Jimmy stuff. And um, mm-hmm. he like like he's done a lot to bring me back into like like talking about it. I still watch wrestling and I'm, I'm still a big fan. And uh, I, I love the work I did, too. But, um, I, you know, I've, I've watched a couple of your shows and things like that. I, I think this stuff's great. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so the, the, the big topic, the reason we're here, I am so, I am actually really glad we did delay the show. We were originally supposed to have this uh, a few days before, but it gave me enough time for me and apparently everybody else in the world that ordered a copy to get a copy of the Devil Budokan, uh, the man behind the mask. Uh, and that's the big thing that we're going to be talking about uh, this week on the show. Uh, I, I managed to get about halfway through the book. I'm right, I'm deep in the middle of uh, of Glenn's uh, <laughs> part of the book, which is a very detailed history and 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 uh, always exciting for me because again, I, I started getting into Pittsburgh wrestling around 2006. So this like there's a lot of stuff in here that that kind of predates I you know that that I hear about. I always hear stories about, and it's really cool to kind of go through kind of a history of that. Uh, so before we get into like this book in particular, uh, 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 Bobby, so so talk to me about this is your your third book, and I realized beforehand I actually missed one of them. Uh, so so talk to me a little bit about like kind of like I guess becoming an author, putting these things together, uh, and, and and kind of the history of that and how that came to be. So it kind of started off as a joke because um, not many people know this, but I have an older brother who draws comics for a living. 
and he was responsible for drawing the latest X-Men comic. Mm -hmm. So when I would go to my parents' house, they would always be like showing off like all this stuff that he (laughs) did and all this stuff that he's been working on. And I'm like, I have nothing to show for it. Everything I have is online. And like my, my dad's old fashioned, he doesn't watch like YouTube or anything like that. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to create a, um, like a memoir of all my wrestling pictures, all my results. And I'm just going to do something cool that I can give to him as like a Christmas present. And I had so much fun putting that together so that on Christmas, when they came over to the house, I, I gave both my brother a copy and my parents a copy of the first installment, I guess you can say, which is what I consider my, my referee book. It's a detailed uh, history of all of my referee matches mm-hmm. that I've been a part of, including pictures and um, just some cool stuff that I, I stumbled across over the years. So my parents were blown away. And now that's like the thing that they show everybody when they come over is look at this. I got this too. So I could one up my brother. But as I started putting that together, I um, was like, you know what? My in-ring wrestling career is going to be ending soon. Um, I'm still refereeing, but as far as like wrestling matches, I've, I've had my time in the ring. I'm beat up. I'm broken down. I just, I can't go like I used to. So I, um, I wanted to document my wrestling career. I wrestled since 2002 and I've kept track of everything because I'm weird about lists and, and keeping like records of things. So I have every documented match I ever had. Um, 90% of them I have on tape too, which is kind of cool, but I wanted to, to document everything and preserve it so that when my, my daughter's old enough, she can look at her dad and see all the cool stuff that he did once when he was younger. Mm -hmm. So that's how I put up number two, the the book about my wrestling career, which is this one here. I'll send you links to everything so you can attach it to the videos. Absolutely. Uh, and then I started working on some things on the side, and it was actually my wife that really helped put the uh, the Devil Project in, in the works. Her and I have talked a lot about Jimmy's passing, and there's a lot of stuff that I – that I held in for so many years. I uh, I never really opened up to too many people. Obviously she knows everything. And I told her and she really helped me to, uh, to get it all out. And I, I just decided that, you know what, this is the right time to really speak about the situation and tell what happens to somebody when they do lose somebody in the way that uh, I lost Jimmy. So I wanted to do this for a few reasons, that being the first. And, uh, you know, being a dad, it changes you. And um, knowing that he was a father of three, and I'm not going to speak ill about his his wife, but I, I thought about his kids and what they might think. And they're, they're at the age now where I'm sure they're going to have questions I think the his oldest kid is probably about 18 now. And I want her to one day find this book and pick it up and look at it and know exactly who their father truly was. And that's that's what I tried to to do with this this story. Absolutely. It, 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 you know, I again picked up the copy. I've gone about uh, gotten about halfway through this and hearing about that history. I mean, this this is a, a, a you know one you do have the history of his matches and interesting to see some faces in there uh, that I that I recognize and uh, the imagery and and kind of an idea of everything that was going on at the time, uh, including a lot of stories, a lot of kind of anecdotal stories I see from um, uh, Shirley Doe. That, Go ahead. That picture right there is yes. from uh, it like it's a match that gets circulated a lot. It's when we wrestled. Uh, sexual harassment and Sabu. That was the locker room picture we did right before that match. Nice. That was actually a photograph that I took. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> one of my one of my many hats in in the professional wrestling world. Um, the to, to back up to when I first met Devil, mm-hmm. I I used to actually run and manage his website when I was in in high school. It was like a um. What was the old uh? What's that old like? Uh, oh gosh, what like was Angel it? Fire was the the tripod? Yeah, yeah, it was yep. like an Angel Fire tripod type gimmick. Yeah. It was an Angel Fire website. If if you go on that history like website thing where you can go find like the archives, archive.org. You, 
Yep. If you type it in, if you type it in, you can go and actually find the website. It's, I think it's uh, devilbee.net, I believe is the actual link. And you can still find it on there and everything still exists. Nice. If, if, if I can back it up just one second, I also wanted to say like, that was a big, the, the, when, when Bobby contacted me to write some stuff about this, that was like the most, one of the most important things was the party touched upon. I, I worry that his kids don't understand how much of a positive influence he had mm -hmm. on so many people. I really hope if anything else, they read this and they also get to see the anniversary, show, not the anniversary show, the um, memorial show that we did, like it, how much raw emotion and like it's stuff that, that we'll carry with us the rest of our lives positively, positively. Absolutely. Without, without a, a doubt. One of the things I'm kind of bummed about when I ran the, uh, the, the memorial show is I had everybody talk in front of the camera, but I was so busy trying to get set up that I never got the opportunity to say my piece. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is an accurate portrayal of what I would have said uh, in front of that camera. Absolutely. And I was telling you guys beforehand, like that, that will book on the Marmara show is, is, is very important for me. Like not knowing uh, much of uh, devil being when I got into wrestling in the area, but it was the first kind of uh, uh, view for me, you know, seeing every, like everybody all over the place come together and kind of see Pittsburgh wrestling do that. And we've for various reasons, uh, 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 good reasons and unfortunate reasons, seen that since in, in a few ways. But I, I, that there was something there that was a different vibe than, than we've seen since. So when when I was training under Devil, he mm -hmm. had this vision. Um, he and I lived in the same town. So he mm -hmm. would pick me up. And I was 14 going on 15 years old when I first started training. So obviously I couldn't drive. So he would swing by, pick me up, and we would drive from my town, Munhall, all up to Penn Hills where our school is. And he would just talk about wrestling and like smart me up to everything. And he had this vision of running a show at um, Monroeville Mall. He wanted to do like a like a super juniors tournament because he was a junior heavyweight wrestler. And he had this idea of like creating a committee of promoters. Like he had it all on paper that he wanted to do, you know, uh, like five or six different committee members that would vote on matches have every promotion involved and it would be just a good way to keep the entire area together. And obviously it never happened. So when, when I was thinking about doing this memorial show, I said, what better way than to get every promotion involved? And that's mm -hmm. exactly what happened. It's the first time in the history of Pittsburgh wrestling did everybody come together for one night for one cause. And it was a huge success, no headaches, no egos, no bullshit. It was straight business and everybody worked their ass off and we gave the people that were there in the middle of a crazy snowstorm one hell of a night. Oh yeah. I, the emotion in that locker room, like I'll never forget that night. It intensely powerful moment just for, you know, for a guy who did, like I said, had done so much for us. And just, it was so much hugging and so much tears. And um, I don't know. It's just, it's just one of the most raw and most emotional um, shows that I've ever been a part of. And, the, and the, the energy from the crowd was crazy. Like it was, I think people realized how we were like, we were like howling to the heavens, you know, to, to try to contact Jimmy in that moment. It was amazing. When, um, when I reached out to all the, the different talent that, that I talked to about coming in back for this show, um, JT Rogers was one of the, the first people that I contacted because I knew of his relationship with, with Jimmy. And JT's first words were, can I bring my photographer? I said, absolutely. And I want to show you this picture that he captured right here. This picture sums up the entire night right there. Just the, the, the raw emotion of everybody in the locker room. And unfortunately, I can't get the disc to work, but I have all of the photos that he took. And there were so many more just like it that I would love to, to look at again. And I, I couldn't get any of them to work for, for this book project. That's a shame. <laughs> That's a shame. 
So, so, mm-hmm. so, you know, you know, he's, he's touched on so many lives. And of course you're collecting these stories. You have your own stories with this. Um, as you were collecting these stories from everybody and I see, every, you know, so, so many names in here, they're very familiar. Um, do, were there any kind of anecdotes that maybe surprised you as you were kind of collecting things? Not at all, because everybody had the same, the same kind of relationship with, with Jimmy. I mean, mm. he was all business when it was time for business. He was funnier than heck. He was a prankster and he was a leader. He was a leader in a locker room. So you could go to him and he would give you the honest to God's advice. And it was just a good dude. Like everybody has positive stories. Like not one person has a negative story to share. He never had a crossword with pretty much nobody. I know the one person that I've ever heard uh, had a crossword to say about him. And that was it. He was a complete like father figure in terms of the way when I was coming up in the business, the way he treated me and it was not in a patronizing way, but in like the most nurturing, but sometimes, you know, sometimes having to also be like, Hey man, you need to chill. Like it it was a combination of, of both of those things. And it it meant the world to me. Um, Bobby was talking about things like picking guys up. I remember when my car broke down, I couldn't get to practice. He drove all the way to Southside slopes. That's where I was living in an apartment at the time just to take me back out the other way to go to practice, you know, and once again, for, for what, like, you know, it was, we, we weren't even a tag team at that point. I hadn't broken in anywhere at that point. It was one of those things. He just, he, he was one of those guys who always gave of himself first. And mm-hmm. that's, you know, that's why this book was so important too, is I, I really hope people understand that. Like there, there aren't a whole lot of selfless guys in the business. And I, you know, like myself too, I was, you know, like, I wish I was more selfless when I was in the business. Like I was definitely trying to get somewhere and, and, you know, I was looking out for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and Jimmy was the real, I say this all the time. People are like, he was the, the real article, the, the genuine article, a guy who would give you the shirt off his back without thinking twice, the real deal. Uh, he, he literally would give the shirt off your back because I can show you right here. He, he gave me the shirt off of his back one night. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's the truth. No matter who you were, he would, he would help you out. If it was a guy that was in the locker room that people like to make fun of, he didn't, he went over there and he built that kid up. There's so many guys that will tell you that, that when, when he when, when certain people weren't being treated like one of the boys, he made them feel like one of the boys. Absolutely. Even in, even in his booking too, because he he booked CWF for for many years, and he would give the guys that never got that opportunity a chance to to showcase why they became a professional wrestler. That reminds me of the you know I, I touched on this briefly in the book is the it, it, the first time I met him at that show is a perfect example. Um, uh, we're doing this outlaw show. I'm barely you know I should honestly shouldn't have been in the ring. And he totally was willing to talk and help and all those things. And, and he didn't treat me like an outsider or like I didn't belong there, even though mm-hmm. honestly, I probably didn't at that time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was a fun story. Uh, Glenn, I think this is your story uh, about uh, uh, you, him getting you booked at PWX, even though he had like current at the time issues with the promotion in some fashion. Uh, and, that's, a, that's another really great example. I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. Let me. You, you no, absolutely. Please. So yeah, he, he introduced me to Quinn Magnum at a, at a, whoop. he introduced me to Quinn Magnum at a, um, at a CWF show mm-hmm. and, and helped me get booked and helped me get my, my first in on at PWX. And once again, it was, it, it was one of those things where he obviously couldn't work there because there was some heat there that uh, actually Bobby was able to explain to me. Um, Jimmy had tried to explain it to me earlier and, and honestly, the whole thing flew over my head. Uh, Bobby and I recently talked about it and it makes more sense now, but I still don't, it's one of those things that I don't grasp, like in terms of, um, there are just things that go on in independent wrestling that I'll never completely understand in terms of like, why, why would this last this long? Why would anyone (laughs) care this much? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like stuff, stuff happens. People lose shows. People lose buildings. Like, you know, 
to hold on to it for any real length of time didn't make a lot of sense to me, but I tried to grasp it, but it didn't matter. Um, you know, he, he, he walked me up to Quinn Magnum. Quinn and I had a conversation and, you know, and, and he vouched for me and, um, Quinn was willing to, you know, like take a chance and bring me in, uh, to do some stuff. And so, uh, it was, it, it was really, it worked out really well. Um, in terms of getting me once again, it like it, he helped me in so many ways to get to like next step, next step, next step. And it was that constant contact and constant willing to work with me. Um, he also took me out. Uh, my first mega championship wrestling matches were with, were with Jimmy. He took me out to those. Those are out in, up, out in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, making those connections where I met like guys like Chris Cole, uh, Jeff Traxler, you know, those guys who helped me once again, help me with next steps and, and moving up and moving up and moving up. Um, and, and, you know, even when, once I had done some other things, like, like when I got to go to Japan and all these other things, um, you know, he would always come back to me and, and I, it's in the book and I don't want to spoil it, but I, I just like, I, I feel like it's important to say the selflessness thing. It's so crazy. He came up to me one night after a show that he had come to watch. I think I wrestled, I, it was, uh, I think we wrestled Cole Cabana that night or whatever. And he came up to me and he was like, and he was like, you, like, you're doing good by me. Like, that was what was important. It was a real Mickey Rocky type moment. He was like, he was like, the fact that you're doing well is doing well for me. And I, like, I swear to God, I just, I just started crying. Like, it was, you know, uh, the fact that, like, that that that's what mattered like it wasn't it wasn't about you know like once again it wasn't about oh am i the most successful it was like oh no, no the people and you know the the guys i've helped with like i i i love seeing them do better than me so it's like uh, it, he passed that on to me uh to be able to get over yourself you know what i mean absolutely so uh, the book's just coming out, and and Bobby, you were telling me before the show, uh, you like this is actually getting some traction out there. Like 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 there's there's a there's a response to this. There there absolutely is. I think because mm -hmm. mental health right now is like a huge issue, mm -hmm. and people are now starting to like talk about it and open up about their experiences. Where you know at one point it was taboo to to speak about suicide and and somebody that they knew committed suicide, like they forget about that person. Well, they're humans too. Mm -hmm. And there's an issue that led to that. And I think it's important that people need to talk about it because it affects people. Um, I can, I can speak in length about how bad it affected me. And um, I gave up a lot of opportunities because I was not there. I emotionally, I shut myself off. I built up these walls that took years to, to come down um, and I, I missed out on a lot of opportunities because I, I fell down a really dark path and, you know, I'm human. I made a lot of mistakes and I, it took a long time to, to dig myself out of that hole. And I, I think it's important that people need to hear that because it, it is a, a big issue in this world right now. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, and it seems to happen, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to say it just it happens a lot in wrestling, but it, it does, like, you see it around wrestling a lot, too. Absolutely. Uh, excessive, like, the, the party scene can kind of get out of hand. And, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I was absolutely guilty of that. And, and I think there's also this, I, I don't know if you guys have ever heard this concept. It really resonated with me when I was dealing with, when I left wrestling uh, as a, as a participant, you know, not as a, like, once again, not as a fan, not as a guy who loves to watch, you know, like who loves the business, but as a, as an actual competitor, um, performer, et cetera, et cetera. There's a concept. I don't know if you ever heard, um, an athlete dies two deaths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I don't think, I think the hardest thing, um, and Jimmy wasn't done necessarily like, you know, like, I don't, I don't think he had, he, he hadn't officially like left the business or anything like that. But I think when you, when you come to terms with where you are in the business and maybe this is it, and this is as far as you're going to go, I can tell you, um, the reason I stepped away for so long was because it, it crippled me mentally. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'm not scared to say it, you know, it's one of those things like I, you know, like losing you know like once again i i walked away i had to you know we, we just just there were so many different situations particularly financial that i just had to i had no choice i basically would like i'd run out run out my rope and um uh and then 
you know, Jimmy dies and, and, and all this stuff goes on and you, you feel, you do feel like you're dead. You feel like you're dead inside because this thing that you had poured your entire life into, you're like, this is as far as I go and trying to figure out what you're going to do next and how you're going to, and, and how you're going to pick up those pieces is crazy when you've mm-hmm. devoted like so much passion to something. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, I was, I was six years into the business when, when Jimmy died and I was just off of two successful UK tours and I made a lot of connections over there. And one, one of which was with the TNA office. And I had some people that were higher up within TNA that were really pushing for me. And I had a lot of opportunities come in my way, but I fell down that path because I took his death very hard and I, you know, started partying way too, too much. And I, I looked at it and it was TNA's right here, but I end up fading off and I lost out on that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a tough business. Uh, so of course people can, uh, pick this up. Uh, uh, Bobby, you're not done with the books. You have, you have more stories to tell, of course. Uh, Plenty more. I understand. <laughs> <laughs> maybe maybe there's a whole list of them. <laughs> you, you got yep. the you got the bug at this point, right? I think so. I, I think I'm on the pulse of something here because mm-hmm. uh, there's there's so many people that that you could write books on, and I I hope that one day that I could knock every single one of them out because I think that's great. It's it's a different thing right now in this world. You know, people are all about the social media and and watching stuff online, but pick up a book and read. And, learn even more. And I think the stories you're telling are super important in terms of the, I, I mean, maybe not in like this weird, like global scale, but they're important in terms of, I, I think, especially at that time, like the, the, you know, the, the, the early two thousands of Pittsburgh wrestling, there was so much magic going on that because YouTube hadn't become the biggest thing yet. And all these mm-hmm. other things, I don't know if people know it's great now that now I like on, on that indie wrestling, uh, <laughs> is indie wrestling.net. Yes. In in wrestling.us. I'm so happy. Oh my God. <laughs> like matches I forgot I was even in. Like it's so cool. I was like, uh, but 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 people don't understand. There was magic, man. Like, like honest to God, real magic in that ring. Like so many talented people that you might never have even heard of uh going on, you know? Well, Pittsburgh was the place to be. Um I, I've said this time and time again that when I spent spent my tours over in England at the merch table where Pittsburgh Indie IWC DVDs right there, right there at the table in England. Like that's, that's crazy. Like those were hot items overseas. Mm -hmm. So Pittsburgh as a whole was the place to be. I know so many guys made a name for themselves locally from coming from out of, out of town. Hunk was the first time he was flown anywhere. Mm -hmm. Pittsburgh. That's huge. Yeah. So, you know, Chris Hero catches his first break in Pittsburgh. It's huge. It's 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 insane, and I and I hope that one day that I can tell everybody everything that I I know because like yeah. right now, like creatively, my head is just so full of ideas, and there's so much that I'd love to get out. And, and there's so much. There's so much. Like you know, we talk with you. Know, IWC, you know, had good video production through the majority of its uh, its run. And, uh, and, and there's so much kind of hidden in there. Like, I don't know the PWX histories. I don't know the, uh, uh, was a CWF history. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always something I heard of and never got to, you know, like there's these other things that maybe you were an IWC fan or you're a PWX fan and don't know the others. So like, I feel like so many fans may only know a sliver of the story that even, uh, 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 lived through it. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, since quarantine, I, I've gotten on, on a lot of Zoom calls and, and Skype sessions with a lot of my friends. And uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was doing one with a, with a couple of my, my buddies. And we were just talking about like 1997 mm-hmm. through 1999 Pittsburgh wrestling. And there's so much of it that I didn't even know about. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've been around Pittsburgh wrestling since um, mid-97. So it's like it's crazy just to hear some of these stories, and I think that's going to be my project for the foreseeable future. Just get these stories out there, educate everybody, because 
I know I sit back in the locker room and I, and I'm that old timer now <laughs> that, I, that I tell the stories of the olden days to these kids that, you know, my referee shirt is older than. Yeah. Yeah. It, the amount of fun. And, and, and once again, this kind of positive super energy that was going on in these locker rooms, it is insane. And I'm, I'm sure it's still like that. I like, I don't want to say like, Oh, my time, like, uh, oh, music now sucks. You know, like I, I, I don't want to be like that. I'm just saying I can't speak for what's going on right now, but the energy that was in those locker rooms, you know, in the time that I was there, it was beyond contagious. It mm-hmm. like, you just felt it well up in you. Every show was the show you could be discovered. Yep. Absolutely. Cause you never knew too, at that, at that point who was watching. Cause there were so many people coming to Pittsburgh just to watch shows. Yeah, it was crazy. Some, some, like I said, when I, when I got, when I got pulled to Japan, it was just <laughs> like Mackie had brought over those, like, the, like these two Japanese guys are just watching the show. Like mm-hmm. it was at the, uh, they watched the, uh, they went to the, um, oh gosh, the war memorial show. Okay. Johnstown, right? War memorial. John, yeah. Yep. Johnstown. Yeah. I like you, you just never knew. And, and so the thing was you had these guys that were out there and they're just killing each other. Because you just didn't know who was in the, you know, who was in the audience that night. Maybe there was a scout for ROH. Maybe there was a scout for whatever. I mean, not scout, but whatever, you know, like trying to get like, you know, just anybody to, to get knows of you. Maybe some super fan that was going to go on a message board and be like, oh, my God, this guy's the next big thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's great. Well, we do have a we do have a question from the chat room from one Justin Idol. Uh, when is the audio book coming out? <laughs> I think we're doing maybe it I'll, now, aren't we? Maybe I can get Bulk Nasty to read it. Oh, <laughs> nice. I would, in all seriousness, Bobby, if you did that, I would. T- I think you could get every one of those workers that 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 put content in there to read their sections. I think that would be really cool, actually. That would be good. That, that, that would be cool. But I again, like when you when we go back and watch the Devil Show, how hard it was for certain people to talk during their uh their yeah. little testimony yeah. it might be difficult to do absolutely absolutely uh well you're not done yet as we mentioned you have many more projects coming up and i understand you do have one maybe not the audiobook just yet but you do have something else that you have in the works yeah i just uh i just talked to some people and i i, I sent you the the cover so hopefully we can get that that shown up here but um my next book project i'm going to do is on another very important person to my wrestling career and um I spoke to his kids about it, and they are completely 100% on board. But uh, my next story is going to be about JT Lightning. Nice, nice. It's going to be called, it's gonna be called There's Your Boy. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Absolutely excellent choice. So so not familiar as much with JT Lightning myself. What is the history on that that phrase? That was his saying. Really? Okay. That was his saying. It was on the back of his T-shirt. He used it in every promo, every match. I mean, that was JT Lightning was awesome to have in the locker room, and he was like one of those guys who he he was an absolute straight shooter. You knew exactly where you stood with JT Lightning literally the minute you met him. <laughs> he was he was no, he was dude. I like in a world of like you know once again. Like wrestling's a weird business and people are very political and shit like that in a world where you would want to like, like it worked for me because I'm a big dummy and a guy who would like, it's like, Oh, I know exactly how you feel about me because <laughs> it's like, you're totally right. What you see is what you get. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, I worked for him, uh, extremely regular, um, probably missed. I think, I think he's actually, he's like, four shows I missed for him over a seven year period. Jeez. So yeah, he was, he was my boss and, and he put me in a lot of situations that really made me a better worker. And, uh, I, I learned so much from him as, as well as I did with, with Jimmy. So uh, I'm really happy about this one. Um, again, I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, I'm not going to take one penny off of proceeds. I'm donating it all to charity. Mm-hmm. Same with, with devil's book. It's all going to the suicide prevention. So I, um, they never asked for a penny off of me. I'm never giving them a penny. Uh, like I'm not, I'm not taking a penny from this. Sorry, and Bobby, thank you for doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it, it is, I guess there's a JT story being dropped in the chat room right now. 
And <laughs> and uh, uh, by the way, the Sonny Landell I think was just featured over on Greg Irons' uh, podcast. I, I haven't listened to that, but the, I have. I, I wish I would have known that he was filming something like that because yeah. I was the first person in the ring post Sonny Landell pooping himself, <laughs> and I have. I have <laughs> an even funnier uh, part to that story because I don't know how accurate Greg told it. Um, but so, so here's the story. I'm sitting in gorilla with JT, Chris Hamrick and Jerry Lynn. And we're watching the match. It was Sonny Landell versus unibrow match striker student named Al Qaeda. Oh, oh, what year is this? What year is this? <laughs> this was, this was in <laughs> 2006, maybe. And, um, I'm sorry, I can't hear you over him laughing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I apologize on the I can hear myself. JT obviously hated the name, so oh, he made him yeah. change it to just Big Al, but he still did all the uh, gimmick stuff. Mm -hmm. so, they're working. Uh, Tom Dunn is the referee for the match. And they're, they're maybe like two minutes in. JT's talking about how much he loves Sonny Landell. He's got this great old school character that works in Cleveland. And he was like, I want to use this guy regularly. Anytime Hamrick's booked, Hamrick, bring him with you. I love him. Next thing you know, he shoots Sonny into the corner, takes a big backdrop, and Sonny just lays there. And Al comes over, hooks him, and Tom Dunn does the one, two, three and then Sonny rolls out of the ring and he comes back and JT's like right at the curtain he was like man are you okay and he just like throws the curtain and he starts walking past he's like god damn it and we're like you okay are you hurt he's like nothing man just just leave me alone he walks past and then you smell it and he he had it all on the back of him it was it it was so gross <laughs> <laughs> You know, the show goes on, so I have to go out. Yeah, to the you ring. got no choice. I go out to the ring, and um, I see something in the ring, and it's it's dark in, in Turner's Hall. I don't have my glasses on, so I see Hank standing there, and he's like kind of like moving something. And um, we had this this ring bitch that would come and and pick up all the jackets and stuff. He was this little little turd from from cleveland I, I don't want to say his name because i don't want to give him any press but um he he was doing all the jackets and stuff and i looked at him i'm like hey man come here i was like go get some paper towel and the the cleaning spray so he runs goes goes again and he's trying to hand it to me i was like no dude pick that up like hurry up pick that up and get this out of here and let's clean this so he actually picked up the big turd that was left in the ring and had to like clean up the area <laughs> My, my, uh, like the things I remember about JT aren't as, aren't as nearly as humorous, but I will say this just to put them over. Um, when I worked for Cleveland, all pro like totally professional, well-run shows just in general. And I worked him, I worked him actually just like in a match in a uh, mega. And once again, like smooth as silk, mm -hmm. just a guy like you got, you know, like, boom, you tie up and you're just like, Oh, this is going to be this is going to be an easy night. Like we're going to have some fun. He made it look so effortless. And I think that's, that's what set him apart from everybody else. And he likes the misfits. And since that's pretty much my favorite <laughs> band in the whole world, <laughs> how can I, he had a misfits gimmick. The second I saw him in a misfits gimmick, I was like, I love this guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, wait till you see the cover of the book. You'll appreciate it then. <laughs> nice. So tell me, where can you, where can people find uh, all your great publications and the, the future ones coming up here? And of course, we'll include links in the uh, notes as well. Absolutely. I, I'm publishing everything through Blurb. Um, so you can just go in there and just type in my name, type in any of my book titles, Devil Budokan. Um, let's see, the, the my professional wrestling career uh, over the years, you know, are the different titles. So you can search for them and be able to look them up right there or just message me directly. Um, my DMs are always open. You can always send me a message and I'll shoot you a link to them. Like I said, all the proceeds for the devil book going directly to suicide prevention. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, guys. This has been so much fun. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Glenn, thank you for joining us. We're going to have to get you back I, on and talk about God knows what. I, I'll talk about literally anything. I'm, I'm, I, I am very, very chatty. Okay. But uh, but I, I just wanted to say once again, like, Bobby, thank you so much for contacting me. 
and you know the the only thing i can say like in addition to that is like thank god for you know thank god for jimmy fawcett because um what he did for me is beyond what you know like once again i can't i can't thank him enough he helped me and i had many people help me there's a billion people next time you know if you ever have me on again i'll thank everybody but um but it, it like he really helped me get my start into what is probably the most interesting like wonderful magical part of of my life you know like we you know it's just this crazy crazy experience and um and i owe i owe a lot of that uh to him awesome and i'm i'm really appreciate that that bobby brought me in on this because uh it was something i had to get off my chest and i'm glad i could be a part of it and and bobby did an awesome job Awesome. Thank you, man. I, I appreciate that. Uh, there, there's so many people that I had to get uh, involved because if it weren't for for Jimmy, none of us would be in the position that we're we're in. Uh, because he he pushed for us, he molded most of us, and more importantly, he was our friend. I mean, he was friend, mentor, brother. He was he was super important to everybody, and I I just I couldn't do it alone, and I'm glad that everybody came out on board to do it. Um, you especially, Hentai, uh, JT Rogers. JT Rogers did a pretty cool painting um, that, that's included in there. And I got the actual like physical print and it's like, it's, it's badass. It's, it's just so cool. And I'm just so happy that, that it, it came together the, as well as it did. If I can put something over too, like the, the Hellfire Club in general, like that whole thing, Sam, uh, uh, Joey, Jimmy, holy shit. Mm -hmm. uh, you guys have no idea as a young wrestler looking at that, how much you wanted to be a part of it. Like, mm -hmm. holy crap. There's a reason why I bought the Mantis gimmick. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. I'm sorry. Mantis too. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Those, um, those were just some good times. And like the, the stories, the matches, everything was just fantastic. Like, they were the red hot angles at that time. Yeah, it was like when 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 I when I first got booked on a CWF show, like watching that stuff, it's just like, oh my god, like that's where you like, you know if you if you were interested in in heel in working heel, holy shit! It so was, like I said, like I said, it's like lightning. So th there's a really cool picture in the book um, that I that I had to include, and let's 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 find it real quick. Oh, let's not, let's not forget Katarina Heist too. Absolutely, can't forget about her. Here's the picture. <laughs> so, I am sitting directly behind Jimmy in the front row, and that angle was red hot. With the tombstone off the top rope through a table. The next show they had the funeral of Super Hentai. And the heat <laughs> in that building is insane. <laughs> and then, you know, he comes back baby face and saves the day. But you can't you can't do that stuff anymore and get that kind of reaction. Mm -hmm. They were so hated. Um, R.I.P. Sarah Guntram. She damn near ran dough down with her car in the parking lot <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah there was like the heat was legit it was they did such a good job it's like you know once again every heel these days what uh i don't like music now or whatever like every heel these days wants to be loved i mean like they got the heat <laughs> without a doubt i mean there's there's so many stories and like i can i could talk about those days all all day long it was those were just the best times and i i try to educate some of the kids that are coming up now that have no idea who paved the roads for them mm -hmm. and, I, yeah. and i will and i always go to bat and say there's two guys that are responsible for 99 percent of the guys in the locker room super hentai double budokan they were the first two that were under 6'5, 250 to give these young guys an opportunity to showcase the cruiserweight style, the Japanese style and the Lucha Libre style. Yep. And, they, I, and, and, and for pure mentorship, I throw Sam in there too, obviously. Absolutely. Yep. 
they were the ones that were most instrumental in changing the landscape of Pittsburgh indie wrestling. And Sam, Sh- guys- Shirley Doe, for those that, that, that don't know in the audience. Yeah, I mean, because once again, like you were talking about, like these guys, the thing about these that crew is like they wanted to educate. They wanted to talk about tapes. You go sit in a basement <laughs> with them and watch tapes. <laughs> and that's like, it, it's like I said, I, I'm sure people do it now, but God, man, like, you know, that's another thing I'd tell anybody who was like in their first year or whatever, watch a billion tapes, you know? And, and, but these guys would sit there and watch tapes with you and deconstruct them. Mm-hmm. How many times do we have tape nights in my garage? Yeah. Yeah. There'd be a group of us to sit back watching whatever, just to, just to pick them apart and, and take them to practice that following Tuesday. I mentioned it in the book, but Jimmy's the kind of guy who would like, he'd listen to you cut a promo, you know, mm-hmm. and, and try to talk you through it. He did that to me. And I, I tell that story in my book, the one and only singles match I had with him. Uh, he was booking CWF at the time. And we were starting this angle, which led to uh, the anniversary show. And he wanted me to go out and cut a promo, but he forgot to tell me the promo, what what the topics were, because he was so busy getting everything else together. So we're like minutes before bell time. And he's like, oh, yeah, by the way, you have to say this, this, this and this. I'm like, what? My music's playing and I have to go out. So I'm out in the ring and I'm like, I don't even know what this promo is about. So I get out, get out in the ring and I grab the mic and he's telling me the whole promo while we're standing there face to face. So I'm just literally repeating Word for word, what he's telling me to say. Mm-hmm. And it worked. Oh, no, did, no, I had no idea. <laughs> and, I, and I know you talk about this a little bit like uh, before, but like they, um, I actually, one of the neat like little connections of all of us together. Did, do you want to talk a little bit? I know, I don't know how much time we have left. I, that match that you guys had for CWF, the ladders, crazy table, like where you did the, uh, the slice bread number, number two through the, through the table. Yep. Holy shit, <laughs> dude. Oh my God. The chemistry. You and Jimmy had good chemistry, man. Like, we did, and it was it, it it broke my heart knowing when he passed away that I will never get to like really see how far we can go because mm-hmm. I had two matches with him a singles match and then that match and you're absolutely right like we could we we didn't call a whole lot one of the things that threw me in a funk after everything went down was the absolute realization the one thing we never got to finish was like, like any tag team breaks up. It's absolutely inevitable. Mm -hmm. But, but Jimmy really wanted to do some kind of blow off feud. Um, with, he, he he cut the promo once with me and I loved it where he, he used that line. And I'm, don't get me wrong. It's a cliche line, but it's such a good line where it's like, uh, you know, I taught you everything, you know, but I didn't teach you everything that I know. Um, and I, you know, and, and, and with, and, and his goal was like, like once again, to go, to go back to this, we keep pointing to this thing with Jimmy and, and selflessness and, uh, he wanted to put me over at the very end of it and all that stuff, you know, the, the way a good, a good heel face angle works. And, um, I, the fact that we never had, we, we never really got that chance. Like it, 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 it definitely ate at me. Um, you know. Because I, I think it would have been a good program because because working with Jimmy was was easy, man. Uh, I, I feel kind of like bad that I haven't said this either at, at, at this point. But there's another person that we, we really have to thank, too, for opening his doors to us was was Joe Perry. I, I Yeah. Like considering the fact that he had just passed, I mm-hmm. I fell out of touch with Joe. But I mean, same thing. It's like if Joe Perry, if Joe Perry didn't have that ring in that place that we could use and that whole thing. Like, yeah, once again, it never, it never really pops off for me at all. Sure. And, and uh, I'm in the same boat that, that we, we lost contact. I, I saw him once in, in maybe five years and I'm kicking myself that I didn't reach out more. Same. I mean, and he always treated me well. And the thing about Joe Perry is he ran a lot of outlaw shows and things like that. But the thing that people need to understand, and this is unbelievably important it's going to sound mercenary as hell, but it is the, it is the literal highest compliment. He always paid the boys. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of these shows, like they're outlaw shows, like, like the crowds are shit. He always paid the boys and the workers out there that are hearing this will understand what I mean. Like mm-hmm. the, the, like to regular people watching this, 
they're going to be like, who gives a shit? I'm telling you, it is the highest of compliments. Like, I'm not saying he ran the, the greatest shows on earth, whatever, blah, 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 but he cared about the boys and he always came through with what he said he was going to do. Okay. Absolutely. He, he was another one. He was the godfather of Pittsburgh. Um, when you hear stories of any of the old timers talking about Joe, Joe's been around probably the longest mm -hmm. and he has so many stories and he, he played such an important role in the history of Pittsburgh wrestling where he ran some of the first independent shows or as, as we've now coined the outlaw shows, but he was, he was the master of them. He knew, he knew how to cut corners, but run successful shows. And yeah, they and weren't. When I, when I say outlaw shows, it's not disparaging. It's just that my understanding was like now looking back on it, I don't think he had a, license oh, to run them like yeah mm -hmm. no license no doctor but you know they were what he considered private parties mm -hmm. yeah so they weren't you know maybe there was, wasn't an admission but you know that and, was his way around it and the boys knew the score like we all knew <laughs> what we were getting into come on I, I, this this ties it all in together but the, the very first show that i i physically met jimmy at was an was a joe perry outlaw show mm -hmm. my I tell the story in, in the book. So I'll give you the Cliff Notes version. My mom worked for Giant Eagle. They had a company picnic. One of her coworkers was another local professional wrestler, gorgeous Greg Wallace. And uh, <laughs> and um, so there was a there was a match between Vince Viper, which was Devil Budokan without the mask, and Seven Forty Seven. Or JoJo Binks, depending on show, <laughs> but that was Super Hentai, and they uh, this was in Renzi Park in the Keysword, and uh, JoJo Binks jumped off the top of a, a fence, split into two baseball fields, and broke the fence. And <laughs> I believe I believe that is also there are a couple a couple quick little anecdotes that you might find funny. Number one, if you ever look at my tape, real quick, uh, if you ever look at my tape in any IWC match, if you get a quick still or whatever. You're going to see VV2 on my left hand. And that was, that was because at one point when I was training, when I was real dog shit in the ring, like, yeah, uh, Jimmy was like, well, you're never going to really be a devil Budokan too, but you might be a Vince Viper too. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also, um, so I, I always put VV2 on my tape when I went to every match, every effing match. I would put VV2 on my tape as a tribute to Jimmy. That was before any of this bullshit went down. That's just because I love the guy. And then um, uh, the other thing was, I believe that is the match where Chris, Chris, Chris Cole did a dive in which he climbed on the top rope and said, I'm a giant eagle. Bok, <laughs> bok. <laughs> Rika, that was, that was three years later. Oh, was it? That was okay. three years later. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Yeah, they ran that show successfully for three years straight. Okay, all right. Well, I was on the show where Chris Cole said I'm a giant eagle and did the he did he meant to do an eagle thing, but he looked like a chicken. <laughs> oh god, we'll be here all night, uh, guys. Thank you so much. I have to cut it. Like we have to cut this off at an hour at least. Uh <laughs> Dude, I'm uh, super. Thank you so much for the invite, man. No, Talk about absolutely. Jimmy. It, like I said, if you want to do this again, I'd, I'd do it any time. Like talking about Jimmy is easy. Very no, easy. Absolutely. He's, he he is literally the best of us. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Glenn. Glenn, is there anything uh, anything you need to plug or anything like that while you're here? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What, I don't know what you're up um, to these days. I'm an I'm an old fat man uh, sitting in my basement right uh, now. Just uh, um, go, go look I up Glenn, go look up Glenn Spector on on Indie Wrestling US YouTube. There's a bunch of his stuff in there. <laughs> I I sell games for nerds now. I own a game store in Castle Shannon, so check it out. Drawbridge Games. Oh, oh, I drive by it all the time. We're 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 like ten days, eleven days away from our five year anniversary. So thanks nice. for everybody who buys games. Nice, stop in. Uh, and uh, Potter, where 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 do you want people to be checking out your stuff at? Yeah, you get RPW Wrestling One Three Eight at Twitter. Um, I don't even know what my Instagram handle is anymore because I got hacked not too long ago. Oh. Um, it's Harold Potter One Three Eight. How about that? So you can just hit me up on there. Um, and DM me, and I'll send you links to all my 
my project. Jake Garrison. I'm terrible at social media stuff. Jake Garrison in the chat saying, keep going. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure this is better than Raw. So. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I got nothing to do until 8 a.m. tomorrow. So, <laughs> uh, Thank you guys so much. Please, everybody, pick up the book. Uh, again, we'll have links in here. And uh, and again, please uh, uh, support your friends, especially, you know, I, I think, you know, they're, I know... Bobby, you can, you've been sharing a lot of stuff about suicide prevention. Very important, especially with everything that's been going on in the last several months here. A lot of people uh, getting kind of cut off from whatever has helped them keep going. So, um, you know, definitely good to, uh, to have that awareness there. I will also uh, keep that hotline in the uh, in the chat in the notes as well. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for checking this out and sticking with us and, and hearing some great stories uh, from from uh, the good old days here. Uh, until next time, please support indie wrestling. This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at sorgatronmedia.com.